it's June. We typically think of June as graduation season, don't we, with all the high school graduation ceremonies, and then we have those wonderful graduation parties, which I love, by the way, the food, the cake, oh my goodness. It's fun to remember past years, to look at what's been accomplished. I think of the picture boards you often see at graduation parties, looking back at all those milestones. There's so much to celebrate. And of course, the number one question <clears throat> that that graduate gets asked countless times at those parties is, what's next? What are you doing now? Our granddaughter just finished preschool. <laughs> kind of a different vibe, but she was very proud. And, you know, they had a celebration for her, the kids at school. But what she's the most excited about is the next thing. She can't wait to go to kindergarten to learn to read and write and do math. She is so excited for this next step in her life. And the high school graduates are planning their next steps, making plans for work or for school, excited about the next chapter in their life as well. So what about us, Christians? <laughs> What's the next thing for us? Perhaps you're new to this whole Christian thing and you're looking forward to digging in and learning more about Jesus. Or maybe you haven't yet made the decision to follow Christ. And if that's the case, I hope you'll talk to someone. Even today, talk to me, a member of the staff, one of these lovely people here in this congregation. If you're online, give us a call. Talk to a trusted Christian we would love to walk with you through that decision, pray with you, and answer any questions you may have. But for those of us that have already made that decision to follow Christ, whether it's been five years or 50, what is the next thing? When I say <clears throat> Christian education, what's the first thing you think of? For most people, I think, they think of the children, Sunday school. But Christian education doesn't end because we've been confirmed or because we're adults. Christian education is something we need to pursue our whole lives. Mm -hmm. I like that. Believe me. We don't know what we don't know. <laughs> God will continue to provide revelations if we continue to pursue God. In Philippians 1, Paul says this to the church in Philippi, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. So did you catch that? Keep on growing in knowledge and understanding so that we know what really matters. Have, have you ever had a job that required continuing education? <laughs> uh, there are several, actually. Things like lawyers, accountants, engineers, pilots, doctors, nurses, architects, pastors, and the list goes on. And when I was a parent for the first time, 
I read the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting, as well as many other books. I wanted to know about it. As a grandparent, I read books about that. Are any of you gardeners, chefs, bakers, DIYers? We read books and watch videos and go to trade shows and so many other things to be the best we can be at these things. When we have a passion for something, we want to know more about it. We want to grow in our ability, learn new techniques and so on. And it's no different for us as Christians. Are we passionate about our faith? About growing more in love with our triune God? John Wesley was uh, the founder of Methodism. He had some things to say about becoming and growing as a Christian. Wesley spoke of grace, prevenient justifying and sanctifying grace. Now, the different words for grace doesn't mean these are different types of grace. It's all God's grace. It's just the names clarify when they happen in our lives. So, prevenient grace, that means to precede. You know, you've heard the term ha uh, Hindsight is twenty twenty. Well, that's what comes to mind here. Long before we even realize it, God is at work in our lives, moving us towards a moment when we will realize we are sinners in need of God's grace. Looking back, I can see God at work in my own life, leading me to that moment when I made Jesus my personal Lord and Savior. Even just looking at the circumstances that got me to Hastings, it's mind-blowing. I didn't realize it at the time, but it's amazing. And that's the work of God's grace, what Wesley called prevenient grace. And then we have justifying grace, when by faith, which is also a gift from God, we believe and trust in who Christ truly is is our sins are forgiven wesley called that justifying grace and just to be clear this is not something that we earn i know many of you have heard this again and again and again we don't earn it by being a good person this is the grace of god in the second chapter of ephesians we read god saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Now, whether you've had a life-changing, born-again moment, or perhaps a different kind of rebirth, that doesn't mark the end. That's not, wow, I, I get it, I'm done. No, it's just the beginning. This is the time in our lives when we're on fire for Christ. I remember it well. There is so much we want and need to know that we become almost sponge-like. We're soaking up every little bit of information we can get about God and faith and, and how we fit into this big picture We've become a new creation in Christ. A transformation is taking place. And all of this leads us to the third part of Wesley's concept of grace, and that is sanctifying grace. To sanctify something means to make it holy. But what does that mean for us as human beings? You may have heard God meets us where we're at, but he doesn't leave us there, right? I've heard that many times. Well, by God's grace, God's sanctifying grace, we become 
mature Christians as God's Holy Spirit works in us. As we read in Romans 12, 2, God transforms us into a new person by changing the way we think. That allows us to learn God's will for us. It's that transformation I was talking about. But this doesn't happen overnight. Sanctification is a process. And there are so many things that get in the way. We're flawed human beings after all. Things like fear and depression and temptation. John Wesley wrote many sermons about these spiritual issues. And that's one of the reasons this path of discipleship, this way of salvation, <clears throat> excuse me, as Wesley put it, it's not meant to be a solo endeavor. We've heard many times, and from Romans 12, reminds us we benefit from each other as parts of the body of Christ. Through spiritual disciplines, we learn from each other. We build each other up with love and support. And this sanctification we're talking about is not just a personal aspiration, but also for the greater good. Things like fighting racism, social injustice, earth care, and so on. So what is the goal of sanctification? Yes, we want to align our will with the will of God, but Wesley also spoke of Christian perfection. We've talked about this before. The first time I heard this, I immediately scoffed. I mean, seriously, how is this even possible for a human being? Innately flawed, sinful, completely imperfect does God even ask us to pursue perfection? Yes, actually, he does. In the fifth chapter of Matthew, Jesus says this, but you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Oh, my. I don't know about you, but I am so far from perfect. At least we aren't alone in that. Even the Apostle Paul writes about not having reached perfection, but that he's pressing on towards the goal. So what does perfection look like for a human being? Well, I think we find the answer in the two greatest commandments. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Easy to say. Something else completely to actually do. We're kind people, aren't we? We try to be kind to others. That's a really good thing. Don't stop being kind. But do we truly love our neighbor? And what about God? God. Do we love God for God and not because of what God has given us? Just like we want our own children to be grateful, to be thankful for what they have and what we've done for them, but we also want them to love us based on who we are, not solely on what we've done for them. Author Tim Keller asked the question, if it's possible that a man or woman can come to love God for God alone, love God for God's self, so that there is a fundamental contentment in life regardless of circumstances, yes, Keller believes this is possible, but only through prayer. The Apostle Paul spoke of learning to be content in every circumstance. And of course, the key word there in that sentence is learning. 
Paul had to learn to be content in every circumstance. We're never done reading scripture, never done praying to God, never done worshiping, spending time with other Christians, whether in Bible study or fellowship or service or missions. Being a Christian means a lifetime of learning, practicing like a doctor practices medicine or an athlete practices a sport. Do you ever watch TED Talks? They were real hot for a while. I don't hear about them too much anymore. There was one I watched a long time ago, like 10 years or more. And I still think about it periodically. It really stuck with me. It was given by a woman named Amy Cuddy. During her school years, she had been identified as a person who was gifted, highly intelligent. Then she was in a serious car accident. And because of her injuries, her IQ actually dropped. She felt as though her whole identity had been taken from her. She attempted college and struggled. She was told, you know, Amy, you're just going to need to let that go. Colle college isn't going to work for you anymore. But she worked very hard. And eventually she graduated. It took her four years longer than her peers, but she did it. She had a mentor who really believed in her and ended up getting her a position at Princeton. Amy said repeatedly that she felt like an imposter being there. She wasn't smart enough. She didn't feel like, like she had a right to be there. But her mentor kept telling her to push through that. And believe it or not, what she kept saying to Amy was, Fake it till you make it. Then one semester, Amy had a young woman in her class who was not participating at all. She met with this young woman and said, you know, you've got to participate or you're going to fail this class. And this young woman confided in Amy and said, I'm not supposed to be here. I feel like a fake. I'm not smart enough to be at this school. I think I need to drop out. And it was at that moment Amy realized that she herself had made it. She didn't have to fake it anymore. And she told this young woman the same thing her mentor had told her years before, except she changed it slightly. Instead of fake it till you make it, she said, Fake it until you become it. Well, I'm going to take that one step further, and I'm going to say as Christians, practice it until we become it. Practice by doing all those things I just mentioned, praying, reading scripture, spending time in worship, both corporate and personal. Spend time with each other because, you know, iron sharpens iron. Christian perfection is the goal. Author Sandra Higgins Mathe describes this Christian perfection as full communion with God and others. Now, I'm talking about communion with a lowercase c. The definition on the screen says, the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. So, Mathe describes a discipleship path which begins with God's invitation to this communion, this intimate relationship. 
followed by deepening communion through all the disciplines I just mentioned. And then finally, full communion with God and with others. The transformation that takes place brings us from merely a faith community into a communion of grace. That is God's spirit bringing us into ever-deepening relationship with God and with others. This full communion or Christian perfection may not happen in this lifetime. I don't know. But one thing is for sure. Our work isn't done. We may have graduated from this part of the journey, our first part, middle part, whatever it may be for you, but we have not arrived. So what's the next thing? My prayer is that we will continue to pursue God, adding whatever spiritual disciplines we're able to discover what we truly need in our lives and guide us through the plans God has set for us since before we were born. I say, let the adventure begin. Let's pray. We haven't finished the race, God, but with your help, may we persevere, growing ever closer to full communion with you and with each other. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you.